A pound of that same merchant's flesh is yours. The court awards it, and the law does give it. Most rightful judge. And you must cut this flesh from off his breast. The court awards it, and the law allows it. Learn it, Judge. A sentence. Twenty twelve, a German court held that circumcision of babies and children constitutes criminal assault. Under existing United States law and international human rights declarations as well, circumcision already violates boys' absolute rights to equal protection, bodily integrity, autonomy and freedom to choose their own religion. A physician has a legal duty to protect children from unnecessary interventions. Physicians who obtain parental permission through spurious claims or omissions or rely on the American Academy of Pediatrics position also risk liability for misleading parents. Circumcision violates the cardinal principles of medical ethics to respect autonomy, self-determination, to do good, to do no harm, and to be just. Without a clear medical intention, circumcision must be deferred until the child can provide his own fully informed consent. Circumcision is usually performed for religious, cultural and personal reasons. Early claims about its medical benefits have been proven false. The American Academy of Pediatrics and the Centers for Disease Prevention and Control have made many scientifically untenable claims promoting circumcision that run counter to the consensus of Western medical organizations. The foreskin is a complex structure that protects and moisturizes the head of the male member and being the most densely innerviated and sensitive portion of that part is essential to providing the complete sexual response. Circumcision, the removal of this structure, is non-therapeutic, painful, irreversible surgery that also risks serious physical injury, psychological sequelae and death. Men rarely volunteer for it and increasingly circumcised men are expressing their resentment about it. I have a strong sense of empathy, and I'm a reflecting person. I'm desperately grasping for anything beyond initial disgust at First Testament thinking. But it's First Testament belief, not thinking. I think, therefore I am. Slaughter your firstborn child and abuse your other children forevermore isn't thinking. Parent believers give them no responsibility to act for their babies. Against all legal precedent. Hugely tenacious legal representation and placement. Placement within secular authorities and then justification because of the justification of the secular authority. And it's big business. Antiseptic herbs were known in ancient Egypt and every time since, though, they perhaps weren't necessarily accessible at all times if you're a slave building pyramids or something. Um, Egypt, ancient Egypt, was... <laughs> much more humid and tropical than it is now. The smells carry in hot and dry much more, but in humid places, bacteria thrive. It's an instruction when you're going through IVF not to have oral sex because the saliva is a slight spermicide as well as an antiseptic. Perhaps some individuals need the desensitisation over time so that they're not TWC Weinstein-esque habitually affected. Or perhaps the cause and effect works inversely. By exposure and desensitisation, other passions are brought to the fore. Ambitions, intrigue, and sort of gallows humour. How does such a prehistoric practices persist? Perceived needs or necessities from thousands of years ago might be needed again for some post-apocalyptic future like the Bork. So there might be 
pogroms in the future. There might be zombies in the future. So prehistoric practices are taught and maintained as survival wisdoms, not to be forgotten at any cost. The cost is pogroms, not to be forgotten, but the past is there to be learned from. I know that's hard to believe. I'll get to that later, actually. Um, in the Philippines, a tropical country, the government has for generations had a summer special offer. You bring your son to hospital and we'll have him circumcised for you. Pretty much like a public health campaign. Um, street children don't have the facilities for washing, perhaps, and bacteria and the like, and transferring things to women. Now, in some ways, American approach to healthcare for some can be similar to a developing world country. of American boys are circumcised more or less at birth as part of a healthcare package by First Testament Ethos Hospitals. There are ways where this is easily reversible and very difficult to reverse. Too much um, reversing meant that some Jewish leaders decreed that there was insufficient cutting if the second layer wasn't irreversibly cut. In the Philippines and South Sea Island cultures, it's commonplace to make a butterfly type incision on the top and often has been the culture of a incision on the underside into the urethra that causes much more significant interventions. What happens to the extremely valuable to a women's face cream industry. In a laboratory they can be regrown to many times their original size. Meters squared of foreskin can be produced from one wonderful that's used for burns victims, skin grafts and the like, but sold for $100,000 to cosmetic face cream manufacturers. It sort of accounts for the prevalence of the practice in modern day America. Certainly not all Semitic cultures have circumcised at eight days old as a fundamental commandment of their religion. Muslims usually wait for some sort of informed decision before or after puberty. The for the child, abuse of the child you doing this is a, only really a First Testament culture thing. The consenting of parents to child abuse of their own child through belief goes much further than just the cutting. Israel Orthodox and American Orthodox Jewish families have the mother pass the child to the father and a godparent give the child to the moral, often a rabbi, often a virgin just doing it for a hobby. But the parents hand the baby child over to be abused in front of their face. The religious leader then cuts, makes the circumcision and sucks clean blood to where he is, she has made the incision with their mouth. It's something that's come to my attention again. Whenever I've learnt of this before, I've wanted to not believe it and I've wanted to quickly forget it. The religious leader sucks the baby child's little pipe. This is something that the child will never go to heaven. Whatever they do in their life, they won't go to heaven unless this happens. This is fundamental and centric to the religion and certainly the Orthodox. And it is fundamentally child abuse and routinely courts in America choose to think otherwise. Whether you hit your child is one thing, that's child abuse, but having someone work on your baby child's baby is up for debate. Apparently, in 1972 and much more recently, Influenced 
sentences of Noah religious leader giving happiness to the baby child of a religious persuasion in the state authority and judicial system leads to a folding of prosecution under sustained legal protection and the veracity of organised public opinion, even using the horrors of the Holocaust as an indicator of what could happen again because it has happened before that objections have been raised to this religious child abuse and resulted in pogroms and holocaust rather than that Beppe exists and is still carried out might possibly be the reason for the pogroms and holocaust in some small way not an indicator that it might happen again now for Jewish burial circumcision on a dead child that dies before the eight days needs to be carried out on the corpse. I'm unclear as to whether Bepe occurs, the sucking occurs on the corpse by the religious leader. something with lightsabers out of Star Wars. And when those flows of urine collide, it splashes outside of the bottle and squeals could be heard and Father had to join in. The younger child, as he's still his way, had a ease to pull back his foreskin. When the older child was spraying, like when you first turn a hose on and it goes out at all hours of the clock. So Father says that you must pull back your foreskin. This is a point that's laboured and laboured and it's intensely painful for this particular child. This is four or five years old. I'm sure it would have happened in its own time for each individual person's own need. But for the parents' insistence that this must be done, they didn't want to try because it was so intensely painful. They consulted a doctor and the doctor was very experienced at this and sort of did it as a hobby at times. There was a consultation with the doctor and the parents and the child of reasonable mental capacity, but not anything that couldn't really be influenced by a Mars bar, probably. The doctor did explain that it would probably happen in its own time. He could do the operation. While I'm here after the examination, why might I want to have it done? It can help people be more ambitious and concentrate on other things. It will be painful for quite a while. Why is the father insisting on it? The pulling back of the foreskin by the child must be done. It mustn't necessarily be done. The protective patch over the lower half of the torso for a long time after in the hospital is well remembered to keep the sheets from touching the very sensitive, newly circumcised purple end. And then again, bedridden at home with a similar sort of uh, device of cushions that wasn't as effective. Bedridden for a similar period of time as measles or mumps. The same parents sending the child to measles parties of children and mumps parties of children to get it over with. The same wisdoms were criminalised in COVID. Jewish slaves must be circumcised. 
perhaps the original and eternal pound of flesh of Shakespeare. I'm all metric, but a pound, foreskin weighing a pound, that must be a conger. Determined to get what's theirs by right, no matter how it may affect anyone else, and regardless of the consequence. That is pretty much the Jewish protection of Bippa. The oral sucking by the religious leader of the child, eight-day-old baby's penis, was, have been, and will be fought over it. For the right of the traditional child, It is 20-year-old news, plus, that the foreskin of a circumcised infant, a piece of foreskin the size of a postage stamp, can produce approximately four acres of skin tissue in the laboratory gel. Artificial skin derived from foreskins is thought to be successful where donor skin grafts is not because the newborn cells don't arouse the host's immune system. If they did, mother's bodies would reject fetuses. Foreskins are also sometimes used to create the structural framework for the epidermis. The lowered risk of infection is vital to the success of the lab-grown skin. Another plus is the process results in minimal scarring. Patients regain most sensations from nerve endings, and if the burn victim is a child, the new skin will grow with the patient as he or she ages. Still, the process is not yet widespread. 20 years ago, and has a few difficulties to overcome. One, the skin cells divide in the lab fairly slowly over weeks. The sheets of skin that leave the lab must be used almost immediately, and they are so fragile that they can be difficult to transport. The lab-grown skin is also expensive. A 2001 article claimed that an 8 by 10 inch, 20 by 25 centimetre sheet of skin costs about $2,000. American, as they say. circumcised at eight days old in America and Israel grow up to have pubic hair all the way down to where their foreskin would start. A German research organisation grows human skin from the stem cells of human hair and they've created an automated production line process for the manufacturer. Since the First World War, doctors could cut skin from another part of a patient's body, stretch it and perform a transplant, but it's a painful procedure. It wasn't an option for patients who didn't have enough skin left to use. Doctors also tried using skin from cadavers, donors from the victim's family and even other species, but the patient's immune system usually rejected these grafts. They couldn't simply give burn victims an increase of immunosuppressants either, as they were already so vulnerable to infection and weak. They had success growing skin cells from the patient's own skin. If the uh, patient's treated and burned, for example, to use their skin cells in that place, and do biopsy and some of the laboratory where they were growing up to nutrient feedings and vertical division. The process took a few weeks. Eventually, the cells divided until they created a sheet of skin 100 times the size of the original sample. While the skin cells that keep dividing are cancerous, the skin sheets have so far returned to normal or once engrafted. Sometimes the lab-grown skin is treated with an antibacterial protein to reduce the risk of infection while increasing the chance of transplant success. In 2014 it was estimated that 85% of American men are circumcised. It was a practice in the 1900s to prevent masturbation. How successful that was in Canada is difficult to get data on. In Canada, between 1970 and 1995, it's dropped from 50% to 30%. It's dropped in a number of circles in. In America, the American Academy of Pediatrics has a lot to answer for in publishing statements in favour of 
percent, 91% of white men, 76% of black and 44% of Hispanic men aged 14 to 59 were missold as second seasons really for medical science and laboratory profit. Bizarrely, Medicaid is available for infants in all American states and there is no NHS in America. At 14 you have some sort of mental capacity to make informed decisions but the information made available for you to make those decisions can be heavily slanted and heavily influenced. Introduce Brexit now. How people were obviously informed about Brexit but seriously missold. Brexit, heavily American guided, was in large part about having a trade agreement, certainly an American trade agreement, was heavily guided by getting access to the NHS, breaking it up and then selling back the same drugs to a divided and ruled version of the NHS without the economies of scale that um, government and national organisation can have and subsidise highly inflated commercial prices for the drugs. But also the American Academy of Paediatrics, the AAP, would undoubtedly have been after our young male babies' foreskins. Brexit was all about Americans getting our foreskins of half our newborn population. In America, neonatal circumcisions have started being much more outside of hospitals. It's during hospital discharge data. Many parents' decisions are described as preconceived in the so-called United Kingdom. 15% are circumcised. That's serious untapped resources, isn't it? Millions, tens of millions, of little bitter that can be needlessly interfered with and be grown into so many acres of skin that there aren't that many wars that you can make to require so many skin grafts. But it can be used to cover robotics. Skin can now be covered in robotics, humanoid, real looking, real feeling robots. The apple from the Garden of Eden, making new toys for masturbators, initially just guessing who will pay the premium prices of the first issue product, is that the destination of our foreskins, tricked from us by Brexit? All of Europe, the circumcision rate is less than 15%, um, even lower in, in Danish boys, they like their bacon. Generally, the more northern the latitude, the lower the circumcision rate. In Spain, it's very low, but I suspect that it's got more to do with the um, historic expression of the Moors. Israel's circumcision rate is approaching 95%. of a First Testament school makes a mockery of child safeguarding and potentially local government depending on its makeup and sadly also the courts where vast amounts of time can be pro bono and protective like tantrum type rights of maintaining a traditional child abuser because it's some tradition the pet is okay and there's no place for it the exploitation and the exploitation of the justification of suffering's past and tradition cannot be justified within a modern safeguarding context. I have moments where I self-identify as a slave, and the majority of circumcised America are the economic slave majority of the few. I have friends, I know it's hard to believe, I have friends that are trans. I don't believe that more health would Trans incorporates a wide variety of interventions. Some just go as far as cross-dressing and makeup. 
So I would think about to actually do um, breast enhancement surgery and hormone treatments after legally convincing a doctor they are legally a different sex. Some have their number of fashions, some have their number removed and turned into larger. And I need to use the artificial lubricant hands being closer to the entrance and the to maybe to be a part of a world even if it's not the big of and not the big one running the over. Obviously, the distraction isn't usually a sexual identity decision. But on sort of religious grounds, should American parents be able to make these sorts of decisions for their infant children or their adopted children? Is that any more rational than thousands of year old traditional? Okay. Age of consent seems to be 18 now, from 16 and 21. Surely it's rational that 18 and a child can then make a big decision for themselves. A compromised transitional position might be that they've got mental capacity enough to make that decision when they're around puberty. Improvements in education worldwide certainly make that much more feasible. Just look at some of the rock and roll decisions of the 1950s, 60s and even 70s. Or should age of consent be adjusted in line with mental capacity and education? What age is an adult and when can they make the decision to drink alcohol, take drugs? When will drugs be legal and safe and taxed? The sexual exploitation of babies by Bepe is A pound of that same merchant's flesh is yours. The court awards it, and the law does give it. Most rightful judge. And you must cut this flesh from off his breast. The court awards it, and the law allows it. Most learned judge, a sentence. A little.
There is something else. This bond does give you here no drop of blood. The words expressly are a pound of flesh. Take then your bond. Take then your pound of flesh. But in the cutting of it, if you do shed one drop of Christian blood, your lands and goods are by the laws of Venice confiscate. Enter the state of Venice. Oh, up, right, judge. Mark you. Learn it. Shall see the act. For as you urge on justice, be assured, you shall have justice more than you desire. Take the offer, then. Pay the bond twice, and let the Christian go. Here is the money. Soft. Therefore, prepare you to cut off the flesh. Shed then no blood. Nor cut you less, nor more, but just a pound of flesh. If you take more or less than a just pound, be it but so much as makes it light or heavy, in the substance or division of the twentieth part of one poor scruple, nay, if the scale do turn but in the estimation of a hair, You die, and all your goods are confiscated. You shall have nothing but your forfeiture, to be so taken at your peril, Jew. Why did the devil give him good of it? I'll stay, no longer question. Very you, the law has yet another hold on you. It is enacted in the laws of Venice. If it be proved against an alien, that by direct or indirect attempts he seek the life of any citizen. The party against which he does contrive shall seize one half of his goods. The other half comes to the privy coffer of the state. And the offender's life lies in the mercy of the duke only. against all other voice. The power of precedent, the establishment and elaboration of a workable model of colonialization, was the Spanish and Portuguese conquest of the Azores, Madeira and Canary Islands during the 1400s. The native ecology was completely burned off and replaced by a European one, so much so that what was originally there is now completely unrecoverable. This taught the conquistadors, those former crusaders that had pushed back the more educated and refined naval Islamic world, and were now picking on Stone Age people, which did prove quite difficult, with the combination of them knowing their environment of caves so incredibly well, and their whistling beacon alarm system. But it did teach the conquistadors that they could go pretty much anywhere in the world and prosper. 
spurring further conquests, including the new world via the Middle Passage, so crucial to the triangular trade, that ensured the maturation of capitalism and underpinned the elaboration of Enlightenment high culture. The shipping of slaves from Africa to harvest such staples of European life as sugar, cotton and tobacco in the New World. It built the investment structure of capitalism. Lloyds of London grew from coffee, coffee house to international exchange on the backs of slaves. Beyond this, the profits of slavery funded the innovations that made the Industrial Revolution, the supersession of slavery itself, possible. Ultimately, the Portuguese proved more adept at the great game of imperialism than the Spanish. 1493, the Treaty of Tordesillas, the first global carver. Viruses, bacteria and disease built capitalism. The Iberian conquest of the Azores, Madeira and Canaries was a pilot programme for the reshaping of European colonies in the Americas, Africa, Australia and Oceania. In all these places, the newcomers would conquer the human populations and Europeanise entire ecosystems. They dared this because they had seen from the Iberian experience in the Canaries that European crops and herds would thrive in all but the most hostile and familiar environments and that the fiercest indigenous peoples could be beaten despite their superior numbers and home ground advantage. As a result, tens of millions of natives around the world would die. The Canary Islands geography was also important as a stepping stone both to Africa and the Americas. Without Canaria, Spain would have never have been granted access to the African shore and thus the enslavement of its inhabitants by the Borgia Pope. Alexander the Sixth. It was off the Azores that Juan de Colón, Juan the colonist, um, that's Columbus to us, found the ocean currents that propelled him to what he termed the West Indies, and he also had much experience of Spanish colonialism, which he was later to apply to Hispaniola. Columbus lived for a time on Portugal's plantation island of Madeira, and its then ample population of slaves. He married the daughter of Bartoloma, an elderly fellow, Genoese, who had been a protégé of Prince Henry, the navigator, and was the governor of the second largest island of the archipelago, Porto Santo. Columbus had also worked as a sugar buyer for the Genoese banking family of the Centurions, and must have seen slaves in the Canary Islands working on the sugar plantations, which he himself knew well. Genoese... Venetians, Amalfi, these were millennia-long trading posts of the Mediterranean slave trade. The Ratanites had established a worldwide network of trade. They acted as go-betweens, middlemen between Sephardic and Ashkenazic. Ratanites were able to trade slaves and other goods from the Islamic and Moorish world and the northern, Euro northern Mediterranean European world where otherwise little traders existed. From 1000 to 1400, the darkest of the Dark Ages perhaps, many of the eastern spices had just disappeared from Europe. The Gauntshire's people of the Canary Highlands were to disappear. Before the Enlightenment philosophies of the noble savage of oceanic people, French and Italian authors portrayed the native Canarians as innocents living in a new garden of Eden, or Arcadians. When gold and silver coins were shown to them, they took no interest. They were equally innocent of the knowledge of weapons, they respected natural law, they seemed to know nothing of individual property, but divided everything up equally. They spoke a polite tongue like the Italians, sang sweetly and danced almost like the French. Their houses were of wonderful contrivance. Their temple of oratory was adorned with the image of a man sculpted in stone, javelin in his hand. They were genetically descendants of the Berbers of the Atlas Mountains in Morocco that had managed to repel Roman rule, but since arriving lost the use of a boat. Conquistadors described them equally unrealistic, if more uncomplimentary. Dogs and monkeys, barking or howling speech, disgusting table manners and eating uncooked food. Hairy race of islanders who eat both flesh and fish all raw. But didn't mention cannibalism, the conquistadors were always accusing natives of cannibalism.
in the Garden of Noble Maidens, a collection of homilies. The barbarians are those who live without the law, the Latins, those who have law, for it is the law of nations that men who live and are ruled by law shall be lords of those who have none. Wherefore they may seize and enslave them, because they are by nature the slaves of the wise. Mm. This is different from previous exclusives excuses for enslaving Muslims, that captives of war forfeited their liberty on Roman precedents. But in the Holy Land two centuries earlier, the Moors were clearly less barbarians than the Christians crusading against them. Much more advanced culture. The Moors, the Islamic world, the trouble for all concerned was that the native Canarians did have laws and religion too, but it was more sun worship and animalistic. Naturally enough, they worshipped a volcano. Though when a king died, the head warrior would jump off a cliff with the king's intestines um, to keep it company, I guess. In the afterworld, while the mummified body was put inside the clan's traditional cave. With the Muslim seizure of Constantinople in 1453, and a cut off of the slave trade from the east, the Borgia Pope, Calixtus III, issued the Bull Dung Diversus, encouraging the enslavement of all pagans, including the non-Muslim ones, elsewhere, in an attempt to reignite the crusading zeal. Spain's Catholic monarchs expelled the last of the Moors from Andalusia and all other enemies within. They made Jewishness racial rather than a religion. Um, when Africans wanted to gain freedom through manumission, which had been a papal principle, that could be gained through baptism. It became a racial thing and so excluded. Moorish lands were divvied up between ex-soldiers and things could turn inward. But the conquistadors in the Canary Islands didn't have an easy time and um, Delugo, fighting the Stone Age people, suffered loss like from the Sioux and the Big Horn or the uh, Zulu in this. Over the British, that is Sandawana. Delugo's personal millions recruiting a second army after the one he'd lost and run away from left to the wild dogs of the Canary Islands. He gambled his entire fortune on this crusade and won it for others. The main thing was that the Guanches knew that the conquistadors were men and found much to despise in their behaviour. The Mexicans, later, thought the Spanish were gods. It was only after the Spanish were able to gain a foothold on the coast of the island and introduce their own animals and germs that they were able to gain victory. A friar of the time saying, so if it had not been for the pestilence, it would have taken even longer for the Spanish to have won if at all. Examining the terrain, marvelled that the Spanish ever won. Early domestication of livestock was one of the keys to Western civilization's later world domination, as contact with such animals meant their immune system were less naive than those of others they were to encounter, and Westerners also had a larger repertoire of diseases which they could infect these others with, intentionally or otherwise. Superiority, simply because it successfully exterminated so many other better societies, are simply part of the argument of a smallpox laden blanket. The racism that Ferdinand and Isabella of Spain originated to justify their enslavement and colonisation in Africa and the New World has brought havoc through history. And the emphasis on investment and the rational development and exploitation of resources, <laughs> human slavery and sugar and tobacco became the plantations of Madeira and the Canaries, potentially linked rising capitalism and imperialism. There is one thing looking here as well, premature modernist arrogance, a belief that exists already in the form of traditional cultures, must be swept away at the convenience of the vile aggrandisements. What the self-interested hucksters promoting them call progress oh in Western civilization, Islamic offered a more advanced culture and crusaders could offer. I didn't have anything to wear. I don't want to change the world. I'm not looking for a New England. Non-fungible. Damien Hurst burning his paintings to turn them into non-fungible tokens. He's already organised a consortium of art owners to buy his extortion expensive skull <clears throat> diamond encrusted skull. A skull encrusted diamond is like my brain. But non-fungible assets are a bit like a halfway house between 
reality and digital, what exists in the real world and what only exists in the digital realm. Damien Hirst that talks of, and art that won't rot and can be accessed by future generations and enjoyed. Um, yeah, but the technology of VHS, Betamax, floppy disks, CDs, vinyl, anyway, you get where I'm going with that. How can I now access photos that were on Kodak? Undeveloped. Fractional ownership gives the opportunity for NIMBY communities to take ownership of their problem, perhaps in their mind, but when they become part owners of the server or the wind farm. A bit like a sort of bribery, but the inertia isn't from the bribed, it's from the people sharing the profits. Funding of a solar farm on a small scale is facilitated by fractional ownership logged through a blockchain. Blockchain, the technology derived from Bitcoin, cryptocurrencies, which I'm not a fan of when they start saying, oh, we're the answer to gold. Gordon Brown came up with that. For Britain, he found the answer to gold. The only company that does real life turned to non-fungible uh, maintaining the asset in their warehouse only involve themselves with high value, low bulk items like watches and wine and collectibles, which I believe are borderless since Brexit um, to take uh, more than 18 litres of wine from France through Britain to Northern Ireland, or I think at the Isle of Man as well, you would have to employ a bonded lorry um, depositing, it, depositing the items into a bonded warehouse. This is expensive. Um, it's the same strategies that pirates used to take advantage of, where there's a customs area and a bonded warehouse is neither within or without a uh, it doesn't have a country. That truck travelling through England um, doesn't have a country. It, but what I'm getting at there is that the reputation of the fractional ownership offerer um, that hold the items until in some future date the majority of a bit like shareholders want to sell the item that's held in England. You can, as a seller, maintain a certain percentage of what they're selling, can't you? But all the people that have the non fungible tokens. The real victims are still vulnerable to crime. How much effort criminals would go to to steal a watch, a case of wine, a hermitage, or something even more valuable, of greater vintage? You can't really know, but as soon as it gets to Damien Hirst type artworks that you have a fractional ownership of, um, these are millions, millions, millions of pounds, which would require serious security, and the bondholder would be liable. If the items aren't stolen from the bonded warehouse, where does that leave the non-fungible topicons? It's a bit like a there's no murder unless they find the body type scenario. I know you're tired of loving, of loving with nobody to love. That's peer-to-peer -peer lending. Now, the Bank of England, uh, Gordon Brown sold off good percentage of our gold and the Bank of England has been able to invest it more wisely than the dead resource. The gold that sold off hasn't moved, it stayed in the Bank of England, but other less secure countries um, without such a good credit rating pay the Bank of England to keep their money in the British, their money, their gold in the British vault that they bought. This is a bit like a non fungible token, how uh, he sold off the gold and provided like, bonded certificates for the gold. Paper gold, essentially. Now, the gold standard obviously represents security. In times of great troubles, no one that's on the wrong side is going to not take your teeth in exchange for some food, the fillings in your teeth. This is going back in time, of course. Looking at long term trends, there are financial analysts that say that we're at the bottom of the trend in some way is up from here. And no wonder someone, everyone's looking for a new gold standard. Bitcoin is now. Cryptocurrencies are not here. It's the exact opposite of stable. Which really does tend to suggest why the originator 
can't be found why who they think it is. It says it's got nothing to do with me anymore. Similar to David Kelly in the Iraq war. He will have been made an offer that you can't refuse. He, they, and their next door neighbour. <laughs> it's not ridiculous to consider that the British government used the same tactics, hand it over, and the uh, crypto key is somewhere in a Welsh vault. The huge reserve of cryptocurrency that the originator represents would just make them a government and other governments subject to their whim with the ability to cause a global financial crisis. Now, governments are obviously jealous of that. That's their job, isn't it? Politicians. Intercepted in Japan and squirreled away in their Second World War vault in Wales under the control of GCHQ. And the Americans are now reluctant to do a trade deal. <laughs> um, it's why. They're, ha ha ha, we want to fetch a Brexit and then drop you. It's, that's why. They're Californian citizen. There is, of course, a big problem with things being held in bond, real things being held in bond and transferred into fractional ownership. Land banking, perhaps being the most obvious, but people are going to love this in the real estate industry, aren't they? The most desirable properties, the most desirable land, completely made as unusable and remote as royal residences. This is borderless, remember? But there is some sort of legislation needed to look a bit like no tax on children's clothes and no tax on baby food or things that you really need can't be priced out of. Can water be made non-fungible in the Sahara? Blockchain is just the puzzle, is just the security, the record, annotatable and time-stamped, a metadata mix, that you want to say. But the cryptocurrencies that use blockchain, they get in a bad reputation for the traders just robbing people. Um, it's a way of criminals, drug money, people trafficking diamonds, unethical sources of money. It's a way of laundering it. And the bottom of the pyramid selling, you or I, we do the laundry. People speculated in tulips, 1500, I think, in Amsterdam, coffee shops. That was the first stock market bubble in recent history. Someone's always got to try and do better on there. A pyramid scheme is anything that rather parasitically needs more and more members to feed the profits of the upper tier members, the top of the pyramid. But cryptocurrencies have that heavily stepped tier built in and exaggerated even further in its ever-decreasing way. But probably the worst bit about it is the mining. Sure, it's something that can be made, but the vast computer processing power, the rare earth minerals, the electricity that's needed, it's causing global warming to make money and an ever-decreasing amount of it at that. It's devaluing the earth with every meanly mined crypto solution. People hold on to their cryptocurrencies as a pension scheme, not really knowing if they'll ever be able to cash in without being ripped off, but that's the nature of any pension scheme. But what will they be retiring into? A world where everything beautiful and everything good is locked away in a bonded warehouse, and but owned in a blockchain and recorded safe. The rich will get richer and the poor will get poorer doesn't have to be the way. The only company that does real life turned to non-fungible uh, maintaining the asset in their warehouse only involve themselves with high value, low bulk items like watches and wine and collectibles, which I believe are borderless since Brexit um, to take uh, more than 18 litres of wine from France through Britain to Northern Ireland, or I think at the Isle of Man as well, 
you would have to employ a bonded lorry um, depositing, it, depositing the items into a bonded warehouse. This is expensive. Um, it's the same strategies that pirates used to take advantage of where there's a customs area and a bonded warehouse is neither within or without uh, it doesn't have a country that truck traveling through england and doesn't have a country but what i'm getting at there is that the reputation of the fractional ownership offerer and um, that hold the items until in some future date the majority of a bit like shareholders want to sell the item that's held in bond you can as a seller maintain a certain percentage of what you're selling if you want to but all the people that have the non-fungible tokens the real parallel items are still vulnerable to crime how much effort criminals would go to to steal a watch a case of wine a hermitage or something even more valuable of greater vintage you can't really know but as soon as it gets to damien hurst type artworks that you have a fractional ownership of um these are millions and millions and millions of pounds which would require serious security and the bond holder would be liable if the items aren't stolen from the bonded warehouse where does that leave the non-fungible tokens it's a bit like a there's no murder unless they find the body type scenario My mother is entitled to recycle her Christmas present to the small cellar of wine, a cave of wine, to whomever she wants. The balance that I can provide for the preteen and teenage nieces is my present to them. Whether that will do anything towards creating some sort of subliminal conscience when they've got a mum and dad that are looking to turn them into the Le Pen of France. 364 days of First Testament values. Thinking the thoughts induced by horrendous actions by others, but most importantly not acting on them, makes you a higher form of evolution. Gross environmental destruction, financially incentivized, can be resisted and rejected. That makes you a higher form of evolution. The devil is in the detail. The blindness of the project manager who shouts loudest gets is destroyed in their credibility and reputation. Teaching in my brother's small mind is similar blue sky thinking and damned to the intent to the tangible the children are his tools for his end goal of maintaining his position which is ruthlessly sought back to economics and to put in south african that perhaps tells you enough almost an elton that should tell you something musk that should tell you something a testosterone problem that needs to shag the world for everyone else use the world's resources to build an ark to escape what you've destroyed create 13 self referencing incestuous colonies out in the stars the united stars of human which takes the pressure off those that have their finger on the button and it takes the weight off them in their decision making i'm going to end the parallel with a highly intelligent person with questionable ethics nuclear electricity production was sadly accepted by one of the campaign for nuclear disarmament's leading scientists as the least worst option for the planet Nuclear plants have accidents and come under threat in Ukraine, for example. In Europe, France seems to have a monopoly on the technology. By their very nature, they need to be a secure vault. If fractional ownership can be blockchained into society, it can do a lot of good. If the funding for projects gets secured, if stakeholders feel no ownership. But as the technology trickles down, there will be vaults required, like Amazon warehouses, and I'm proposing nuclear institutions must have the reputation of that secure vault so that all ownership of beauty doesn't have to be destroyed in order to create something digital that Gordon Brown's gold can be invested in, for example. I'm not saying Damien Hurst's dot paintings are the most beautiful thing out, but it's a point of reference. For another time, what these 13 massively diverse states in the stars private colonies are going to be like and who's going to go there who went from Europe to the colonies first? They want to humiliate their motherland, like, like the US has done to the UK with the exit vote manipulation that's given rise to re-raising of the Irish question Titanic and the 44-day Prime Minister. A 44-day leader for my ego-driven brother and is apartheid establishing demigod. 
They'd expel the children after 44 days if they don't adapt without question. So, parents, why do parents encourage their children to think of daughters as princesses instead of English? <laughs>